The following program presents principles designed to promote good health and is not intended to take the place of personalized professional care. The opinions and ideas expressed are those of the speaker. Viewers are encouraged to draw their own conclusions about the information presented. Welcome to Wonderfully Made. My name is Dr. George Guthrie, Medical Director of the Lifestyle Center of America. Have you ever been told by your doctor that you uh, should avoid sun exposure? You know, too much sun can actually cause, of course, sunburn, which is uncomfortable, but often lead to skin cancer as well. On the other hand, you need some sun exposure to be healthy. We're here to talk about it today on Wonderfully Made. Joining me is Dr. Tim Arnott. Hi, George. Good to be here. Yeah, good to be here, Tim. Well, <clears throat> so there's this argument, too much sun, too little sun. Um, I'm sure everybody's heard how important it is to stay out of the sun, but what benefits might the sun have to us? Well, George, it's, it's very interesting that... Uh, Sunlight actually can help you lower your risk of a number of diseases. In fact, are, are you aware that sun exposure could actually lower your risk of developing high blood pressure? And that can help you lower your risk of coronary artery disease and perhaps even lower your risk of a stroke. Now, when it comes to your bones, you could actually lower your risk of osteoporosis and uh, an adult form of rickets, uh, so something similar to rickets, that's called osteomalacia. And uh, did you also know that you could perhaps lower your risk, your child's risk of type 1 diabetes by helping them to get adequate sun exposure? Oh, these are some rather uh, uh, amazing claims you're making here, Doc. Uh, it seems to me uh, folks should understand what the active element is that we're talking about here. Vitamin D. Absolutely. Vitamin D is the, uh, the important element. You may not, uh, you, you, well, you may have thought that when you eat that, uh, that bean and that whole grain, that uh, the calcium and the magnesium and the phosphorus in those foods just automatically goes into your bloodstream after the digestive process. But the, the reality is that the Creator has designed us so that in order to get the maximum amount of calcium, magnesium, and phosphorus from the food in the intestine into the bloodstream, you need the help of an important vitamin. That vitamin is vitamin D. Now, George, tell us, how is it that vitamin D is actually made? Well, it's actually misnamed. It's not really a vitamin at all. It's a hormone. Uh, we didn't understand that as we discovered it. We, we came to it through this disease process we know as rickets. And nobody knows, knew what caused the disease process as they began to uh, experiment and try to find out. Uh, one doctor discovered they could take kids with rickets and put them in front of an ark. And that uh, arc would take care of their rickets. And then... You're talking about an arc lamp, is yes, that correct? Yes, an arc lamp, a, a strong electrical uh, arc. And, and then they discovered that uh, you could actually uh, put them, uh, the kids on the roof of the hospital and their rickets would go away. I mean, that's, that was kind of interesting. From that came the discovery that of this uh, substance, actually, uh, w which we call a vitamin, but which is actually a hormone. And what happens is this. Cholesterol in our bodies, in the skin... It, goes through a little preparation process, and then sunlight comes and hits that uh, cholesterol in the skin, and in hitting it, breaks one of its rings and turns it into what we understand to be vitamin D. It's actually a pre-vitamin D first, which can be stored in the skin and then released into the bloodstream as our body needs it to manage calcium, magnesium, and some other things. Absolutely, and so vitamin D is so very important. And the other thing to keep in mind is if you have kidney disease, if you have diabetes and your kidneys have been injured, or perhaps you've had long-standing high blood pressure and your kidneys have been injured from that, 
you may not be turning vitamin D, pre-vitamin D, into the active form of vitamin D. And so it's even more important for those individuals to make sure that they have all the vitamin D that they need. And the other thing that's important is if you have extra dark skin and extra protection in the skin from the sun, those individuals especially need to uh, listen to this program because uh, not uncommonly, George, those individuals who have darker skin pigment are especially at risk of having low vitamin D levels. And they could have higher blood pressure, actually higher risk of cancer, higher risk of osteoporosis, and uh, higher risk of these autoimmune diseases, uh, type 1 diabetes, lupus, and even rheumatoid arthritis. In the uh, recent NHANES data, there is, uh, that's the uh, national uh, collection of data that occurs on a regular basis in this country. When they looked at vitamin D, there were estimates of 40 to 60 percent of African Americans actually deficient in vitamin D. And, and once I say that, we really should point out that if you're going to measure this in your blood to see if you have adequate amounts, that which should be measured is called 25-hydroxy vitamin D. Chances are your doctor hasn't thought of it. <laughs> it would be good for you to write it down. So we'll mention it again towards the end of the program, but just to let you know, 25-hydroxy vitamin D is the important one. It's actually made from the uh, vitamin D that comes from the skin. It goes to the liver, is turned into the 25-hydroxy, and then, as you pointed out, Tim, the kidney changes it to its most active form, the 125-dihydroxy vitamin D. Folks don't need to remember that. Now, George, what they do need to remember, and what Dr. Michael Hollick at Boston University, an expert in vitamin D physiology, recommends is that we have our vitamin D level checked every year, just like you might check a cholesterol level. And as George mentioned earlier, that's the 25 hydroxy form of vitamin D. So really all you need to remember is the number 25 and vitamin D and your doctor should be able to take it from there once a year. Now uh, just a word on where we might want that vitamin D level to be when it is checked uh, because frankly George uh, the last time I had it uh, checked on one of my patients I saw that if they were seven with their level they would be in the normal range. Uh, is that really true? Well, uh, the normal range is generally defined in a population. Uh, they'll measure a population, measure two standard deviations in either way, and then say that's the normal from the bottom end to the top end. But we know for vitamin D that in order to get optimal uh, positive benefits from the vitamin D, it really should be greater than 30 to turn down or turn off the parathyroid hormone and probably closer to 40 in order to give optimal protection against cancer. Maybe we should talk a little bit about that. Yes, actually, uh, very interesting studies coming out showing that vitamin D has an effect on the cells of your body. It actually slows down the rate of cell division, and vitamin D actually encourages the cells of your body to go on to full maturation, in other words, to become a completely fully mature cell. And of course cancer is, is a cell that is dividing too rapidly, cell division out of control, and it leads to cells that are not fully mature. So vitamin D is a powerful tool to help lower the risk of cancer. Now what cancers are we actually talking about? Well I think of uh, Dr. Garland's study that looked at several thousand people uh, got their vitamin D levels and then watched them over several years time to see who would actually get uh, uh, the colon cancer or cancers. They found an 80 percent reduction in colon cancer in those that started out with the highest levels of vitamin D. That's significant. 80 percent lower risk of the number one cancer of men and women who are not smoking. Now that's something that you can walk outside for and uh, frankly you don't have to walk outside for very long in order to get all of the vitamin D that you need. What is the uh, recommendation for skin exposure in order to get at least a minimum amount of vitamin D? 
Well, you know, there's a little science behind deciding this, and I, my understanding is that it's done with healthy medical students, whatever that means. They put them on the, out in the sun to uh, turn them just pink, not to burn, but just pink all over. And if they turn just pink, they make somewhere between 10 to 20,000 international units, just with that slight reddening of the skin. Doing calculations from that, uh, down to the recommended daily intake of either 400 international units a day for younger adults and for those over 70, 600 international units, we uh, find that about seven minutes a day, well, technically three days a week, but better, seven minutes a day with just the head and neck and the wrist and hands exposed will actually make adequate amounts of vitamin D for people. All right, and so uh, you'll want to spend a few minutes. Uh, I believe Dr. Michael Hollick recommends a little bit more, probably 15 minutes, but it depends, frankly, on where you live. If you live in Miami, seven minutes uh, probably is perfect. In fact, it may be a little too much, depending on uh, what kind of skin that you have. So anywhere from seven to 15 minutes, three days a week on your face, hands, and arms not much exposure and it'll get you the vitamin D that you need. But just remember that if you live uh, north of Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, during the winter you probably won't make any vitamin D and so that's why it's important that you store up a little extra during the summer months uh, to compensate for what you won't be making during the winter months. And what is our recommendation on taking a supplement? Are we recommending the 200, the 400, and the 600? Well, how we get vitamin D orally is really another uh, interesting topic. Uh, in order to take care of rickets in this country, the uh, federal government decided to uh, put vitamin D within milk. A lot of us think of milk as a source of vitamin D, but the truth is it's not absorbed that well. And some studies that actually looked at milk off the shelf found that the vitamin D they said was in there wasn't in there to begin with. Now, I'm sure industry has done some things to correct that since that became known. But vitamin D uh, taken orally is not all that well absorbed. And so it would make sense for those people who are at risk. For example, those people who are living in the north in the wintertime, those people who are unable to get out in the sun at all to take a supplement. Uh, supplement. And while the international uh, unit recommendation is about 400 to 600, if you're going to take it orally, probably need 1,000 uh, international units to maintain a level. And we know that it's safe to take up to 2,000 international units a day of the vitamin D without any toxicity or problems. So uh, certainly if you are not spending much time outside, maybe you you have a night job and you sleep during the day, or maybe you are uh, African American and have uh, extra protection in your skin against the sun, and uh, certainly uh, those individuals who are at higher risk, and we're going to talk about that in a few minutes, those who are at higher risk of vitamin D deficiency, these individuals would probably want to take a thousand international units of vitamin D. And as George mentioned, the American Institute of Medicine says that that is a safe level once you hit one year of age uh, all the way through adulthood, and you can take up to 2,000 international units a day. Now, uh, as, as we mentioned earlier, George, there's actually uh, some evidence that uh, vitamin D could actually help lower your risk of autoimmune diseases. Tell us a little bit more about this. I don't think we understand for sure the mechanism probably, at least in my mind, has something to do with that anti-cancer effect where it helps to the cells to differentiate and do what they're supposed to. One of the isomers of the vitamin D actually goes into the nucleus and helps to balance things out. Autoimmune diseases are a whole host of, of uh, diseases which the immune system gets confused and starts to fight uh, our cells, for example, People with rheumatoid arthritis have the immune system turning and actually fighting the joints. Uh, sometimes it attacks the skin, sometimes a variety of different uh, areas. And it seems that adding vitamin D may actually help to control that uh, 
reaction, especially if it's caught early in the disease. And so we see that vitamin D will actually help your immune system, your white blood cells, if you will, to better determine whether what they're dealing with inside you is self or non-self, friend or enemy. And you certainly don't want your immune system fighting yourself because this can be devastating. And that's what happens in type 1 diabetes. Now, Dr. Hipponen at the uh, Institute for Child Health in London conducted some very interesting studies on Finnish children. You may not know that uh, Finland, in, in this country where they have very little sunlight during the winter months, uh, in fact, they don't have any uh, during parts of that uh, time, that season, and uh, they're not getting as much of the direct rays of the sun being that far north. So these individuals have a, a significant increased risk of vitamin D deficiency, and they have the number one, their children that is, have the number one uh, risk of type 1 diabetes in the world. And uh, what they did was to put these children, half of them, on vitamin D, and another group was just put on a placebo. And what they were able to show was that individuals, children in Finland who took vitamin D were at 88% lower risk of type 1 diabetes during the course of that study. Then what they did was to take individuals, children in Finland, and put them on the uh, recommended daily uh, allowance uh, for vitamin D by the Finnish government, 2,000 international units a day, which we mentioned earlier as the, up, uh, the upper limit of safe uh, intake uh, in this country by our government. And what they showed was that children taking 2,000 international units of vitamin D a day were at 78% lower risk of type 1 diabetes compared to children who were taking less than 2,000 international units of vitamin D. And so uh, for those individuals whose children are not getting the sun exposure uh, that you uh, might want them to get, well, for some one reason or another, you would probably want to make sure that they're getting at least 1,000 international units a day. And if they're uh, severely limited in sun exposure, you may want to boost that even as much as 2,000 international units a day. And so remember, vitamin D, sunlight, actually helps your body to uh, not be so uh, interested in harming you, your own tissue. Well, now this is kind of interesting, uh, Tim. I understand why, how the folks in Finland, the kids in Finland, don't get enough sunlight, especially in the winter. It's my understanding that there's an increase in vitamin D deficiency-related diseases in this country as well. Uh, do you think that might have something to do with how much time kids spend in front of a TV or a, a video monitor? Absolutely. That's what I was alluding to. Children are spending more and more time inside. Now, recently we've been hearing about this as an epidemic of childhood obesity and type 2 diabetes in children, largely related to their Le, uh, their non-use of the large muscle groups because they're spending more time indoors in front of the screen and uh, not realizing it. They're not only uh, gaining weight and, uh, and developing insulin resistance and diabetes, but they're de being deprived of an important nutrient, if you will, vitamin D, which is so important for strong bones, for a healthy immune system that knows the difference between self and non-self, and so many other benefits, keeping blood pressure low. Uh, so it's, it's so important to step out just for seven minutes, <laughs> uh, three times a week. We would recommend that you would spend uh, probably seven to 15 minutes most days of the week because uh, vitamin D is so important. But of course, we want to emphasize you don't want to burn your skin. Right. In fact, you don't even want to turn your skin pink and uh, Dr. Michael Hollick would actually tell you that you only need to spend one-fourth of the time outside that it would take to burn the skin to get all the vitamin D you need. So if you'd burn the skin in 15 minutes, then four minutes is all that you need to spend out there to get all the vitamin D that you need. Uh, Tim, you, we've mentioned uh, uh, type 1 diabetes uh, probably not being caused by uh, vitamin D deficiency, but vitamin D deficiency allowing it to come because uh, the immune system is not as balanced. There are also some connections with uh, type 2 diabetes and apparently insulin resistance and uh, whatnot. 
Tell us about that. Oh, this is exciting. In fact, uh, you know, if you have some free time, rather than uh, spending it in front of a screen, you may want to uh, spend some time reading about your own body's physiology. You know, we're told that our children should understand how their body works. And I was fascinated to read that uh, the body actually needs calcium in order to release the little uh, packets of insulin from the beta cell of the islets of the pancreas so that you can put that insulin out into the bloodstream so it can go out and help your blood sugar and uh, the fats in the blood to be taken up. And so in order to release insulin from the uh, pancreas, you need a good calcium level. And of course, you won't have a good calcium level unless you step outside and get some sun or and and or uh, take a supplement. And frankly, uh, we're recommending both. At least that's what I usually recommend to my patients. Spend your 7 to 15 minutes uh, daily out in the sunlight and take at least 1,000 international units of vitamin D. Don't take any more than 2,000 international units. And remember, you've got vitamin D in some of the foods uh, that you're taking in, perhaps, and also in that multivitamin. So take that into consideration when you're, when you're calculating uh, the 2,000 total for the day. Uh, it's also true that uh, not only is the, the beta cell function improved, but also insulin sensitivity. There's some recent studies pointing to that. It's improving help. Uh, diabetics actually need less insulin to get the same response. So that, there's good news for both type 1 and type 2 diabetics in the vitamin D uh, realm. Now, uh, Dr. Uh, Chapoy and his colleagues uh, in Lyon, France, reported in the New England Journal of Medicine a very interesting uh, benefit of vitamin D and calcium for women who are at high risk of a hip fracture. These women were actually average age 78 to 90. Now, they were healthy, but, uh, you know, when you get that to that age, you're at your bones are typically uh, have lost a fair amount of calcium, and you're at higher risk of a fracture. And so what they did was they took half of these individuals, these women, and they put them on a double placebo. The other uh, half of the, of the women were actually put on 1,200 milligrams of elemental calcium and 800 international units of vitamin D. And then they followed these women and, and, and found that those who were taking the calcium and the vitamin D were actually at 43% lower risk of a hip fracture 18 months later. And the bone mineral density, that means the, uh, the calcium part of the bone actually increased by 3% in those women on the two supplements versus a 5% decrease in bone mineral density in those who were on the double placebo after 18 months. And so uh, just uh, paying attention to some simple things like calcium and vitamin D can prevent something very potentially serious as a hip fracture. Because uh, after a hip fracture, what often happens is an elderly individual may be put to surgery to do a pinning of that hip. They may develop a pneumonia after the surgery, and that can, can oftentimes uh, be life-threatening, or it may lead to uh, the rest of life spent in a long-term care facility. And so keeping the bones strong, very, very important uh, benefit of vitamin D. There are a couple other uh, groups of people that are at risk for having low vitamin D levels. One of those are newborn infants. You know, those that are breastfed do not get any vitamin D in the breast milk. Uh, remember, the cow's milk doesn't have it in it. It had to be added, and it, of course, is added to formulas. There are some doctors who are recommending that when babies come home from the hospital, they actually get a vitamin D shot or some uh, way to get the vitamin D in until they finally get old enough and their parents are, are, are able to get them out in the sun so they can get a little bit of vitamin D. At the other extreme of life is this, uh, the elderly group. Uh, people who are older have a decrease in the body's ability to make the pre-vitamin D and so are often deficient uh, in it. And these need to be watched, both these groups need to be watched very carefully. There's another group of individuals who would benefit from vitamin D. There was an article published uh, in the uh, 
Annals uh, in New York State, the Medical Society there, they published a case report of five individuals who had severe weakness. These individuals were either wheelchair bound or they were not able to uh, get off of a, a bed. They were basically not ambulatory. And they found that these individuals were severely vitamin D deficient. And all that they did was to give them a loading dose of vitamin D, 50,000 international units, once a week for six weeks. And all five of these chronically ill patients who were unable to walk were, were able to get up and be ambulatory uh, just after uh, replacing the vitamin D because the muscles actually need a good calcium level in order to have strength. And so if your vitamin D is rock bottom because you're not getting out in the sunlight, your calcium in the tissue will be low. The muscles will not have the strength that they need. And so if you've been facing some fatigue or some weakness of the muscles, vitamin D may be part of the solution for you. At uh, Lifestyle Center of America, where we both work, for the last almost two years, we have been measuring vitamin D levels on people who come for help. Now, these, uh, this group of people often has uh, a group of illnesses that we focus on as lifestyle diseases, diabetes, heart disease, uh, hypertension, obesity. We have found, depending on how we measure it, up to about 60% of these people have less than optimal levels of vitamin D. That's a significant number of people. Getting that monitored and fixed is an important part of their treatment. Now, <clears throat> vitamin D is a fascinating sort of a subject, if you would. Uh, it's neat how the Creator has put us together. Something as bad, if we can put it that way, as cholesterol when hit by the sun, and we might for spiritual lesson spell that S-O-N, becomes something that's very beneficial and protective. It brings life to us, protection against death and cancer, and as, as well energy and a good physiologic function. Isn't it amazing? Tim, in our last little bit, let's review what the levels should be Give people a chance to write that 25 hydroxy vitamin D level down again. Yes, so the uh, vitamin D level that you would like to have is about at least 30, 30 to 60, and frankly, 40 to 60 would probably be even better. And that's again the number 25 hydroxy vitamin D. And just a final word: those with fibromyalgia may also find significant benefit from getting their vitamin D level up because muscles that don't have enough calcium can tighten and actually be very, uh, very constricting and painful. So we would recommend that you get all of the benefits of sunlight that the Creator has chosen and find out once again how you are wonderfully made.